evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Emily Rathley, and I'm a historian and education manager with the Mississauga Heritage Foundation. And it is my great, great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker for um, the second part of our three-part lecture series exploring villages in Mississauga in Ontario. And we have with us this evening somebody who is probably familiar to many of you, and uh, to those of you who have not had a chance yet to, to either meet her in May or, or hear her speak or, or read her words, you'll certainly by the end of the evening get a sense of, of having uh, maybe grown up with Verna May. Okay? Um, <laughs> Verna May is um, actually, we have, you've probably seen just outside um, her latest book, uh, her sixth publication, uh, Cooksville, about Cooksville. And uh, Verna May has uh, researched and self published five other publications um, on Mississauga, starting with my villages of Mississauga in 1986, I believe. So for the past decade, um, this is how her name is described, staying young. He's getting out there and researching and getting one off the press fast enough to be able to get out there and research another one. So um, it is my great pleasure, as I said, to, to introduce you to Verna May. And Verna's going to um, give us a bit of a, a personal tour of historic villages of Mississauga. Last week we explored the lost villages of Mississauga. And uh, just at the close of, of this evening, I'll, um, I'll be giving you an indication of what's to come in terms of lectures, okay? So if you just all help me welcome for me. I've heard 
that student school teachers go there on field trips to see it. <laughs> Although it has a new entrance and a front hall, its old front doors are still there. The original four room section is intact, and the first school rooms got their high ceilings look the same as they did in the early 1920s. A narrow stairway leads upstairs to an attic, which some people say is haunted. But to me, it looks just like any other old attic seen in houses of bygone days. Once when the school had an anniversary and the pupils were asked to write essays about it, one little girl wrote, we go to an historic school but the roof is leaking, and I wish somebody would give us the money to get it fixed. <laughs> Today, we see the name of Lakefront Promenade Park along the shores of the lake. Actually, Lakeview and Lorne Park disappeared almost altogether when, with the beginning of door-to-door -door mail delivery in the 1950s, they received the address of Port Credit, Ontario. Dixie Arena kept Dixie's name, but it has closed out long ago, and we have only Dixie Road. Now, if you take these names and note their locations, they give you rough boundary lines. Cooksville's name was spread out at the top of the Brickyard Hill on the main building of the Brickyard. It read Brick Cooksville Tile for years before being washed away by rains and bad weather. Just this past summer, I happened to be passing by and I noticed the old building being taken down. And today, all that remains to be seen is the softball diamond on Dundas Street, opposite Mason Heights Boulevard, where Mr. Cote had the ground level and set up a ball field for the home games of the Cooksville Brick and Tile Ball Team. Time goes by fast, and buildings disappear in a twinkling. And once they're gone, it's hard to remember where they stood. Middleville saved its name by becoming a heritage village, and Clarkson, once known far and wide for its great production of strawberries, is trying now to keep itself visible by placing signs with Clarkson Village at its entrances. The name is Malton Grocery and Malton Meat Shop on Airport Road exist today in our telephone directory. But who would think that at one time, before we ever had a big international airport, there was a Malton Airport? There's still a Sheridan United Church and we have a North and South Sheridan Way. In fact, Sheridan's name was one of the two names proposed for the name of the new town, but it missed out when more people voted for the name of Mississauga. Now these villages, although marked on the early maps, are considered now to have been only small communities with no boundaries of any sort, simply all run in together. <coughs> But they were actually very much separated from each other with their own stores and schools and post offices, and each with its own rural mail route surrounding it. In winter especially, they were almost completely isolated one from another. When I began to write about them and wondered how I should find their boundaries in order to make little maps of them, Anthony Adamson, who had been reeve of Toronto Township, a member of the Lakeview School Board, advised me that the best way he knew of doing it was to use the boundaries of the early school sections. And there were also the boundaries of the old post offices. And yet, today, there's nothing to show where our early villages were. We have wards with boundaries, but these do not correspond with the old village names. Well, let's not worry about things that are gone. Let us instead look at some of the historic places that so far we can still see. When I was a child and lived at Port Credit, it was just a village. And today, I like to go down near the river 
and see a white house, which still stands on the corner of John Street on the Lake Shore Road. When my mother sent me shopping to John McClellan's store, I would walk past this house we call Pierce House and cross the highway there. This house belonged to Captain Stephen Peer, a late captain, who once owned stone hooking boats and carried stone to Toronto. He lived in this white frame house all his life until he died there in his 90s. And as far as I can tell, it has never been moved or added on to, except that now there's a little patio outside with a board fence around it. Often you find that a house looks the same on the outside, but when you go indoors, you find that the whole inside has been taken out and has been rebuilt and renovated until it's somehow altogether different. The inside does not match the outside. But you can go now to Pierce's house to have a cup of tea or have your lunch. They call it the Chelsea Farm Restaurant now and you can go there. There are stores all over where its front lawn used to be, and the house is hidden now, but it's an entrance off John Street. If anyone has children who are studying local history in school, and they would like to see an old and delightful little house where an old lake captain once lived, it's this one. There are tables with pink tablecloths in the front parlor where they serve delicious salads on pretty pink plates. Or you can go into the old-fashioned dining room if you like. There's a beautiful old-fashioned staircase inside the front door. And you have to hold on to the banister rail, but you can go up and see another little tea room upstairs. This small room has a large map of Port Credit on the wall and pictures of the Peer family who once lived there. The rooms are cramped by today's standards, but at the same time authentic, because that's the way it really was then. The stairs are quite high, and they give you a real sense of being back in the olden days, as people used to call them, or people call them today, they used to be. <laughs> you can better understand what life was like years ago when the late captain lived there. Now, Captain Peer had a son named Bert, who was a hockey player. Bert played in Toronto and later in the American League, traveling quite a bit down through the United States. Hockey players traveled then on buses mostly, and he said it wasn't such a wonderful life, really. In later years, he came back to Port Credit, where he could be found quite often in the mornings at the little barber shop on the State Bank Road. He used to get a coffee and go in there to read the paper and talk to the old park creditors who came in. He would say, if I'm not home, look for me in the barber shop. When he was old, he lived just down the road from the arena. But he never went in to watch the hockey games. He used to say that the kids today go out and play hockey dressed up in suits of armor. He couldn't figure out how they could skate with all that equipment on. He said when he was a boy, he would pull on his woolen toque, pinch his father's work gloves, stick some magazines down his pants, and go down to the ice on the river. That's where he first learned to play. When he grew up, the sports raiders used to call him a park hog because he would never pass the park. But when he was old, he said, that in those early days, the pay wasn't very high. And the rule was that whoever scored a goal got $100. So Bert said, why would I pass the park? If I pass it and the other guy scores, well, there goes 100 bucks. <laughs> well, the late captain has been gone for 40 years, and the hockey player for several years now. But still, the White House, built about 1870, or maybe a little before, stands there on John Street. It reminds me of an old poem we took at school. Do you remember? In the elder days of art, builders wrought 
with greatest care each minute an unseen part that the gods see everywhere. Now let's go along the Lake Shore Road to Lakefield, east of Park Pettit, and visit another little house located near the corner of North Mount Avenue and the South Service Road. This one was not, real, was not only a house, but a store as well. And it's remembered still by a few people as Mrs. Waslake's store. The Waslake family moved out from Toronto to a two and a half acre lot at North Mount and the Middle Road in 1929 and built a house there. And in the Depression times, Mrs. Waslake opened a store in the front room of the house. She got a few cans of peas and other vegetables and set them up on shelves in the front room. And all the money she received, she put back into the business. Her son Bill went picking strawberries and raspberries and saved up to get a bicycle. And after that, he went around door to door gathering orders for groceries. He would go home and they'd pack the orders and then he'd deliver them on his bicycle. People would buy a quarter of a pound of butter for about five cents, and half a pound of sugar for two or three cents. And that was how the Weislicks survived with these groceries. She ordered by the half cakes, a dozen cans of corn, a dozen cans of peas, and other cans of cereals and other groceries, but only a small quantity at a time because she had the room to store it all. Mrs. Wiselick had a machine which made link sausages all joined together in a big line. She kept pigs and cows and chickens and had a large garden at the back. The grocery business was in the front half of the house which still stands there today. The family lived in the back portion of the house. Mr. Wiselick ran a lumber business and Mrs. Wiselick and her two sons, Nick and Bill, looked after the store. She had milk and sour cream and cottage cheese that she made and sold them all from her little grocery store. She learned to drive a car in 1934 and she used to go from door to door in New Toronto, which they now call Etobicoke, selling vegetables from her garden. There were Ukrainian people in New Toronto and they bought the products Ukrainian people enjoyed. Mrs. Waslick would get the food ready and go out to the store, leaving a sign hanging on her front door saying, back in a few minutes, so that people would see it and be sure to come back later. Sometimes they went back two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> the store was open seven days a week until 11 o'clock at night. People could come shopping whenever they liked. There were four cabins on the property, still there, and these she rented to tourists traveling along the Queen Elizabeth Way. The house was built of frame, and in 1936, it was bricked over. And there was always a little veranda there, and the same two windows in the front. When I visited the house a few years ago, Bill Waslick took me on a little tour to show me where his mother's grocery store had been. Its four old-fashioned light fixtures were still hanging down from the ceiling. Mrs. Waslick had kept a big bunch of bananas hang hanging in a corner, and she would cut off whatever the customers wanted. The fruit and vegetables were laid out all down one side by the smaller window in the front, and the big freezer was there, and the counter went across the room near the back. It had a glass in the front with shelves of candies for the children. They could see them through the glass. There were cigarettes displayed for sale in the right-hand corner by the larger window, and a meat counter ran along another wall. This meat counter was eight feet long, and Bill still had it in his garage. The Waslick boys attended Lakeview Beach School, and Waslick's grocery store had a box for their mail at the Lakeview Post Office. At first, the family had a key for it, but since everybody in the neighborhood kept losing the keys to the mailboxes, combination locks were put on so the mail could be picked up more easily. 
Mrs. Wisley closed up the store in 1976. People had begun to buy at the local shopping plazas, and they came into her store only for things which they'd forgotten to pick up at the plaza. She was a remarkable lady who lived to be 94 years old, and her name remains on the front window of her store today, although some of the alphabet letters are missing from it now. It should say Wasley Groceries. But her son says he left it that way because that's the original, and it's best to leave the letters out and keep it original. Now, to a different sort of a building. Located near the four corners of Dundas and here Ontario Street. This heritage building, listed as a commercial building under the name of Irwin Hardware, was built after the Great Fire of 1852, which almost totally destroyed Cooksville. There had been an hotel there before, called the Seville Hotel, which had been saved from the fire, but afterwards went downhill until by the time the 1859 map appeared, it was shown merely as a small black square with the words Old Hotel on it. Shortly after this, the Schiller House Hotel was built in its place. It stood on three acres of land with fruit trees and a garden behind it and was described as a good and commodious house with a great barn at the back with stables and a public hall in connection with it. By 1878, John Edmund Schiller and his wife, Mary Jane Thompson, had sold it and bought the Yorkshire Hotel on Adelaide Street in Toronto. They renamed their city hotel the Schiller House. And the Schiller House Hotel in Cooksville was bought by a chemist named Josiah Green, who turned it into a dwelling on one side and a drugstore on the other. In 1907, the great barn at the back of the property was dismantled and removed to the Cooksville CPR station grounds for a coal shed. Later on, Mr. Green's son-in-law, Hugh Bowden, bought the business from him. And for years, Mr. Bowden operated the Cooksville Pharmacy and became Cooksville's postmaster. It was he who altered the front of the building putting in two plate glass windows on either side of a center doorway on one side of the pharmacy. No, he added an extra window for the post office department in one side of the pharmacy. The public hall, still in use for meetings and entertainments and dinners, which had been known as Pharmacy Hall, then became known as Bowdoin's Hall. J.K. Morley, the undertaker, lived in the upstairs of the former hotel building, which still kept its veranda and balcony across the front. When it was renovated in Mr. Morley's time, the balcony was stated to be fine for its purpose for a while longer. Bowden's Hall later became the Orange Hall, and the Orangemen had to move out when this frame building was torn down in 1928 by William Copeland in order for him to build new stores and apartments <coughs> on the place where it had been. But over all the years, the former Schiller House structure itself has remained in use. Its stables have long since disappeared, and also the veranda and balcony across the front. But still, up to this date, anyway, the original building stands. And just think, those upstairs windows, looking down today on what is one of the busiest corners in Mississauga, look down over a century ago on stagecoaches, pulled by horses dashing over the dusty Dundas Road, carrying passengers and mail to Toronto. Now, from Cooksville over to Arendale, that's where Ernest Lemon once lived, on a rented farm at the northwest corner of Dundas Street on the Mississauga Road, on the hill directly west of St. Peter's Anglican Church. He was born on a pioneer farm at Muskoka, 
in 1910 and moved down at four years of age because his father was working at Price's dairy farm. Ernie remembered the big stables there, located where the woodlands is now. And up until this year, the old stone gates to Price's property remained standing. They've been taken away now, but they were a reminder of the dairy, which once supplied milk for the sick Chalmers Hospital in Toronto. Mr. Lemon had a horse, and when it needed shoeing, he would lift Ernie up onto its back and send him off to the Arendelle blacksmith shop. The blacksmith would put the shoes on, and afterwards lift the little boy back up on its back for the return trip. When Ernie was about 13 years old, his father had a market garden, and he and his brother would throw cucumbers onto a wagon and take them up the road to Sweetsville, where there was a pickle factory. There was a big lake where Arendelle Park is now. The lake was formed by the Credit River Dam, and the boys went fishing there. In winter, they sailed ice boats, like little sailboats on runners across the lake, and then cut ice from it to keep the food cool in the summer. The cement foundations of the dam can still be seen when the leaves come off the trees. It can still be seen from Dundas Street. Bernie attended the first little one-room Arendelle School, which was a rough cast building. And in the winter time, it was cold and they had to keep a fire going in a stove in the center of the room. The pupils sat in a circle around it to keep warm. They got their drinking water from a spring north of the school, and they went bobsledding on the hills of the Mississauga Road. In 1923, a new brick school was built, which stands there today and is known as the Springbank Arts Center. As a teenager, Ernie got a job helping to build a big house opposite the school on the land of the farm where he had lived as a boy. This new house was built of stone and took two years to build. The work was slow in those days, for the cellar had to be taken out with a team of horses using a scoop. But it was finally finished with an entrance lodge or gatehouse on the Mississauga Road, and today, if you go up there and turn left along the first road above Dundas and follow it around, you can see the stone house. It's now known as Glen Aaron Hall. Just before closing, I'd like to say a few words about an old building which is not there anymore. As I used to come down the Brickyard Hill along Dundas Street, I would always look at the old lath and plaster church building. It just seemed to be there, in a convenient spot to catch my eye. This old gray building was Cooksville's first Methodist church, built on Agnes Street in 1844. After their new brick church was built in the 1880s, the first rough cast structure was bought by Samuel Emerson Harris, who moved it around the corner and set it down beside his own house on the north side of Dundas Street. When it was moved, a little note was found inside its cornerstone, stating that William Curtis Stevenson, cabinet maker, August 1844, worked in this church, and a hardened black apple car was found alongside his note. Mr. Harris had a grocery store there, and later, for a while, it was a small lending library started by the Cooksville Women's Institute in 1931. It's chiefly remembered today as Gordon Harris's insurance and real estate office. But one day, as I came along Dundas, I saw that the old place was gone. There was just a bare spot left where it had been. Now, I don't think there's any place which looks small than the spot where an old building has stood. And once it's gone, after only a very short time, you find you can't remember exactly where it stood. When I wrote about the building in my Cooksville book, 
I had to drive all the way back down to Cooksville to find out whether it had stood on the east side or the west side of No Bar Road. So thus, our memories fool us, and we quickly forget our heritage and pieces, places we have known all our lives. And in order to write about them, we must go and check old records. We cannot depend on just our memories to tell us where and what they were. We find, indeed, that we have lost whole villages, and nobody knows where they went. Unable to exist on their own, and yet wishing to remain by joining themselves into the town of Mississauga, they have now been absorbed by a city of an importance and immensity such as they never could have imagined, and they're now no more in a shadowy part of our history. And thank you very much. I hope I hope you were you found it interesting as I did when I when I put it all together. <laughs> Shot, I, can think I, don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether I can answer or whether I'm but I'll try. I was delighted to have a look in the book here, and I opened it up. I opened it up to the part of Roy Pallett, and Roy Pallett was the father of my stepfather. I'm Bill Barber, my stepfather was Don Pallett. And uh, I heard a lot of interesting stories about, about piercing the wine dots. It wasn't as wasn't as particularly a happy a job as some of the people might think that it was. The other thing, too, is I had the privilege, you mentioned Bob Hart, and I had the privilege of knowing him, too. Uh, he died, I believe, in 1969, but I used to take shovels down with him, and he would uh, leave her with the shovels on the hand. So I knew Bob, and, and uh, I had a picture of Bob Hart, and it was a Polish picture in front of the box was shot in 1910. It was a very little squat. Oh. Um, that's a lovely picture. Yes. It's hard to find pictures, and when you have pictures like that, they should be preserved. Well, he was very interesting. His estate was broken up about 20 years ago. Yeah. And I had the privilege of seeing it before it went to Waddington, so there were some wonderful pieces in there. I'm glad to hear about that. You were talking in a corner of uh, your interior and Dundas. Which corner, which northeast or southwest, or what corner was that? Oh, the old building? Yes. Oh, that's on the south, uh, southeast corner. Yes, just a, it's not right on the corner. It's over just a little bit. But it's a pharmacy. Yeah. Well, that's the pharmacy. That's where the old grocery, that's where Copeland's grocery store was. Yes. But it has been on the very, you know, right on the corner. But they moved it over 40 feet. And yeah. the building I was talking about, was the old hotel building. But that was, uh, first of all, that was, um, oh, McClellan, George McClellan's store. And then it was, you know, later on, it was Copeland's store. That's the one where the pharmacy is now. But this was a different pharmacy. It was uh, earlier than that, much earlier than that. In fact, he had the pharmacy, I think it was 1890 anyway. So it was, George McClellan had his pharmacy from 1890. So that one was back before that. And then there was the Cooksville Pharmacy after that. Christie's had one later on, farther along Dundas, opposite the Methodist Church. Was, uh, farther, that was west. Over by the, where the old uh, town hall used to be. You know, the church and the town hall, over that way. That leads to the rest of McClintock's pharmacy, wasn't it? That's uh, McClintock's. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's on the east side of the Strava pharmacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. They had several pharmacies. 
and they're very confusing if you start and pick them out. But <laughs> you have to inch your way along and figure out what time was it, <laughs> you know, because it changed. The years that changed. There was Ward's Pharmacy also. He started out beside the Royal Bank in the little old building, and then he moved into the the old the other hotel building on the north by uh, the the northwest corner that we used to be the Revere House. He called it the Union Bank building by then, and he had a, he had a uh, drugstore in there. And then he moved it over uh, to the other side of the Cooksville Hotel. So the pharmacies kept moving around. <laughs> Depending on who owned them, they seemed to <coughs> start them up in different places. And they would have two at a time, but uh, I don't think they had enough business for any more than that at one time. Didn't there used to be a, I wonder if it were, a hotel on the northeast corner? Oh, yes. I can remember calling it down my father and having, having a coffee. So I was some dear old lady who came out and I was in the curtain. I call. The northeast corner of Dundas and Curie, Ontario. Yeah. No, that was the Cooksville house. That was the, the one that. Dundas and the, and the pen, yeah. mm -hmm. That was the Cooksville. There were three of them. There was the Revere House on the northwest corner. That's where the bank is now. The bank is. No, 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 there's the Cooksville Square. That's where the Revere House was. That's where that little Cooksville Square is now with the flowers and the benches. And then on the other side, where the Bank of Commerce building is, that's where the Cooksville House was, the one that's on the cover of the book. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. That one was there. Mm -hmm. That's what I say, uh, you can have pictures of them and look at them and see how they look, but you have to go around and look to see where they were. <laughs> I have to wander around myself and try and find where things were. But that's the old Cooksville house. Of course, it underwent changes. Northeast corner. Northeast corner, yes. Yeah, that was Bowers Hotel. He had it for a long time, Bowers. And there were very many other people had it, but he had it for the longest time. The church that you mentioned on Dundas Street, was that the, uh, the uh, Methodist church then? Yes. On the south side, and it was taken down about 1950 when the Yes, then they built a new, it's now, it changed, what was it, 1925, the Methodist, I think it changed yeah. to the United, United, and now the United is down on the Mosa yeah. Road, they built that yeah. new. Township bought that about 1950 when they yeah. built an addition onto the old town hall. Yes. Uh, they paid thirty-three thousand dollars for the church. Oh. It, about 1950. I see. I didn't know that, but anyway, I knew where the church was. I lived there, and I knew, <laughs> I remembered that old brick church, but I didn't know what happened to it, and I didn't know about the other one either. It but. was at the time they put the new offices on the Cooksville Municipal. Building. Yes. Uh, prior to that, it used the Cooksville Town Hall, which was part of the fairgrounds. Yes, that's right. That's right. And mm -hmm. uh, then, unfortunately, the, uh, there was a fire that uh, Town Hall was part of town. Yes. Mm -hmm. Took it down. There were a great number of fires. My goodness, I don't know. <laughs> they certainly had fires. Well, that church was to the east of Nobar, uh, near where that Lambert store was. Mm -hmm. I don't know that store. Lambert had a uh, furniture store facing oh, yeah. down that street. Oh, yes. I don't uh, remember that one. But just to the west of the Crescent Driveway into the shopping mall. Mm -hmm. oh, that, it I was see. in that corner where the church was. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us. When you start to write a book, how do you go about it? Do you just, it's, I mean, it's not a <laughs> Take a pen in your hand and a paper, <laughs> and paper, and paper, and paper on the table when you start. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> because, it's, because your books are, well, your later books, not your first one, but your later books are not entirely just your memories. Oh, no, so these are my memories. No, I don't depend on my memories. Uh, no. no. I was just wondering, how do you go about it? Do you just walk around? Do you look at old archives? How do you go about it? 
researching cook stuff. Well, oh, how do you go about that? Oh, well, you want to do it? Go ahead. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Research everything. We need books. <laughs> but uh, what we do is we look at the old, old newspapers and we get ideas from there. And then, you know, old newspapers aren't even aren't always reliable, you know, but you take your, you get some information out of them, and then you have to go to the archives, though, and look up, you know, check on the details and see if there really was something like that. <laughs> sometimes you find things and sometimes you don't find anything mentioned. So if I don't find it mentioned on a, you know, on a document somewhere, then I don't use it because I don't know if it's right or wrong. And uh, so I, I always check, I always make sure, you know, about the fact before I print it. Lots of stories I heard and I, I had lots of things about places, but I never could, uh, you know, find anything to give me anything official on them. So I didn't use the stories. And if somebody just tells me a story, I don't listen. I mean, I listen, but I mean, I don't. <laughs> sometimes they tell me some fantastic stories, like a real good murderer, <laughs> something like that. But I don't use that kind of thing. I just like to. Uh, but you have to go to the archives yourself, and they're not like libraries. You can't, like in our, our wonderful libraries, we can go in and, you know, oh, I would like to find something out about this or that, and, you know, they'll run all around and find things and help you with books and everything. When you go to the archives, you get a big shock because they don't have anything like that. You have to know what you're going to look for, and you have to give them a number and <laughs> a finding book and a number, and then, you know, they dish it, they pull it out from, they tell you where to go and pull it out of a drawer somewhere, but you have to find it yourself, and that's the tough part. It keeps you working, and, you know, we have been to archives. You go to the universities, and you go to big businesses, you know, great big companies, they have archives. Railroads have archives. We got things from the archives in London and England about the trains, and uh, I got some, a lot of my information for this Cooksville book. I got it from British Columbia. I got it from Alberta. They, the, um, you know, archives in different places out there. And you have to write and phone. And I tell you, you run your phone bill up. Well. <laughs> my husband phoned up about nine times trying to find a picture of uh, one of these characters in here. And, you know, they never heard of them. They didn't have it. And then one day he was lucky, you know, and oh yes, we have nine of those. So <laughs> we said, well, uh, you see, we, we, weren't, we weren't going to get in the car and drive up to Ottawa. So uh, I found out the name of a very nice girl, archivist. And so I told her what I was doing and uh, what I'd like to get. And uh, so she said, well, I'll pick some out for you, and then she would send me photocopies of a bunch of them, and then I'd pick out the one I liked the best and send it back to her, and then it came to me. You know, that you have to do it that way. And I wanted to get some about the airplanes. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about an airplane except that flew around up there, <laughs> you know? But um, I, I, got, I, I got in touch with the uh, the uh, airplane archives, well, I forget what you call them, but they're in Alberta anyway, and uh, they sent me to the Bush Plain Heritage Place, and then she sent me to Vancouver and, and oh. another place in British Columbia. We got all around, you know, it took me two years to find, like for instance, there was one man, I read a lot of information about him in the old newspapers, but I didn't know if it was right or not. And finally, we went to Ottawa, to uh, Ontario archives, and never heard of them. But then finally, I got in touch with somebody in Fort York. And he told me the name of a man in Ottawa. I wrote to him, so then he came up <laughs> with the information. But it takes you a long time. You know, it takes quite a long time and uh, patience and a lot of work to uh, trace these things. And, and sometimes you find, uh, oh, there's all kinds of stories, but you have to get the facts before you can write them. You can't put down something just because somebody says it's so, or because somebody wrote it in the newspaper. You know, they don't get anything right in the newspapers either. 
And we have dug through all, you get old boxes in these old archives. Good night, we went into places like old cellars, and they have big boxes and all full of these old papers, and they're all mildewy and smelly, and you put these white gloves on, and you have to go through all these old mildewy things, and they're stuck together, and you pull them apart, but then finally you find out where the treasurer or the clerk or somebody wrote this. Well, there it is. You can now use it. <laughs> so that's the thing. But we start out with, like my husband practically lives in the library here. He looks up all and all those machines. He knows how to run all those machines. I don't, but he does. <laughs> and he looks up, you know, all things like that. And then he says, well, you might find this. Like he get, he'll get a story out of an old newspaper. And then he'll say, well, find out about this. So after about two years, we find out about this. <laughs> and so it takes quite a lot of doing, really. But it, it's a one, it, it gives you a happy feeling when you finally get something where you think you've really hit the jackpot, you feel great, you know, to think, oh, actually, there is really a man like that, you know? Okay. And it, it's a very point, engrossing uh, thing. At what point do you decide when you're writing these books that, okay, enough's enough, I know I haven't found out about this guy and that guy, but I'm going to publish the book now anyway? Like, how do you decide something like that? Well, like, I tried to cut this thing from a certain year to a certain year. Now, this Cooksville book I just did, it goes to roughly uh, 1930, right from the start, like 18, oh, 1800, up to 1930. That's the cutoff. But some things, you can't just cut them right off at a certain year. You have to say, well, this happened later, a bit later. You know, you have to explain something. You know, like you can't cut off the Cooksville Methodist Church or the Cooksville United Church. You've got to tell that they still have a Cooksville United Church. You know, you have to go on, continue it on just a little bit in order to uh, finish the story. You know, and uh, so you, you just have to figure, well, that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah, and besides, uh, when you get quite a lot, you know, sometimes you get more than you think you've got, and uh, this last book was so big that uh, the printer told us when we went out, we just got the books yesterday, four o'clock, they were, she had some ready, or they had them ready, and we went up there, and uh, so uh, we just went up and got them, and, and Tim, he's the printer, the boss man, he said, well, yes, he says, we've got it at last. He says, the New York Telephone Directory. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and he gave me these, they gave me these flowers, so, which I thought would, were nice, and I brought them down to show you. Porcupine's quill. They're nice people, you know, and they help me a lot. They, they're really nice. So, they, they match the cover on our books, see, with the orange and that, you know, the bricks and all. And <laughs> that's what she told me anyway. <laughs> but I thought that was nice, and I thought I'd bring it down and, and uh, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, wanted to comment on something that you had said that you kind of glossed over, and it was the idea of making sure you use fact. But I know just from personal experience that that's going to be a very hard thing for you to do because the people in those communities that you're learning about hold on to their myths very dearly. And you have to be you have to be very careful when you go about debunking some of those myths. Yeah. Uh, you got to be very tactful when you do it too. Oh yes, indeed you do. Oh yes. <laughs> and sometimes people will tell you, you know, they're old and they've lived there all in a place all their life, and they will tell you. This is a certain place, or this is a certain building, or this happened here. And you believe them because you think, oh, they must know. But then you find out later <laughs> that they didn't. <laughs> so yeah, maybe you have to be very careful, and yet you don't want to offend the people and say, you see, they don't tell you lies. They're not lying. But you for that's what I meant when I said <coughs> you forget. You know, you forget. I forget. You know, I forget myself. I'm, just, I'm thinking of the people that still swear that Buffalo Bill Cody was baptized. Oh, yeah, Buffalo Bill Cody. Well, I don't know about Buffalo Bill Cody. I, I didn't get him. I didn't even say, I didn't say anything 
I mean, I know there was there was Cody's, and and he had his hotel or whatever, and I didn't I didn't go into that. Well, <laughs> luckily, I think I, I luckily I think Mr. Cody was over in Dixie. That saved me. That <laughs> saved me. Well, I always thought it was a miracle because the actual birth was registered in 1809 at Buffalo Bill was born in 1835. Oh, well, yes, yeah, you see there, now that's a good example, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> but, as I said, you have to be very careful. And I think my husband and I have tramped through more cemeteries. <laughs> that, really, I'm telling you, we, you know, you go, in order to get a certain date, I mean, you figure, well, if you can't get a date anywhere else, you have to go and find, well, where is he now, you know, and then you get <laughs> Then you get a date, and we figure, well, surely they must have known when it was one of these old, old stones that you can hardly read, you know. We figure, well, they must have known what year it was. So we take that. Yes? I was just going to say, having, I've never heard the myth about Bill Cody being uh, baptized here. Maybe that's your next book, Myths on Mississauga. Well, oh, well, yes, yes. Very much so. <laughs> Because, as you say, there are a lot of stories like that. Well, there's, yeah, there are tremendous stories, and you get them out of the Perkins Hall collection. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, you do, actually. Oh, I heard a wonderful one about, uh, oh, my goodness, it was about an Indian who uh, lived in a cave along the Red River behind a great big stone somewhere. He crawled in here, he had this big cave, and of course, this lady was going out picking wildflowers or taking her little, uh, uh, some children out for a walk and he kidnapped her and he kept her in this cave and good gracious me, it went on and on, all about, uh, it turned out to be somebody who got into the army and became famous and all like that. Well, that was a beautiful story, <laughs> but I, 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 didn't, I didn't use a thing like that, how could I know of that? You know, that isn't the type of right. thing I use anyway. Yeah. But I've got a title for your book already, Mythosaga. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's about the hardest thing to think of, a title for a book, but that's beautiful. You are right, because that actually is how the people define themselves. They don't always define themselves by the fact, they define themselves by the mythology. Oh, I've heard a lot of things about old, my own old family up in Warren Park. You wouldn't believe, oh, I tell you, <laughs> it never happened, I know. There's like PowerPoint. Funny things. <laughs> There's another question in the back. Okay. Oh, I was just going to, just talking about along the idea of myths, um, there's uh, certainly enough inquiries uh, to our office about um, ghosts. Have you come across any ghost stories, not factual, but stories that you encounter about ghosts of Mississauga? No. no. I just heard about the one over in Old Lakeview Park School, and I don't think there's a ghost. And the, you know, they have, you know, in Port Fed High School where I went, they have a ghost up on the fourth floor. You know, they you know, it only goes up. <laughs> you know, it's the floor above. They, they've got their ghost up there. I forget what they call them now. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget. But every year they talk about it when they have a they have a little scholarship, you know, for the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that story came from. I don't think they know at the school now. Mm -hmm. But it's you know the one up there in your house? Yes. Yeah. Oh yes, I heard there's one there too, yes. It's one of the Copeland house too. Yeah. Apparently I got a call from a real estate agent a number of years ago wondering what the strange presence was that they used to see at the front door of the Copeland house. Oh. And I said, well, it's probably one of the Copelands I'll call my friend Kim Clement and find out if he knows anything about it. He didn't know anything about it. No. no. But we bought an old, old farmhouse uh, for our, our um, what do you call it, our project, 1967. What was it? Centennial <laughs> Project, yeah. our old farmhouse. Do you know that old farmhouse? I was afraid to go up the stairs for about three or four years after we bought it because I thought there was a ghost. I'd meet one on the stairs. I got a weird feeling on the stairs. I was going to meet a lady dressed in gray, and I didn't didn't get over that for years. But you know, I don't I don't think there was any such thing. But uh, you know, it, it, sometimes people get that idea because 
Did you just get a feeling like that or something? Did you actually see a lady in gray? No, upstairs? no. I you didn't ever to. see a lady. No. Oh. If I did, I think I would have I would have run off to the hospital or somewhere and said, What's the matter? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I don't. Well maybe there's ghosts. I don't know. People believe it. So maybe there is. I don't know. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't think of saying that there was a ghost or not a ghost. I don't know. There's there's so many things that we don't know, and and the, the older we get and the more we go along here, uh, we got such weird things today that there could be anything. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any last questions? Maybe one more. No. Maybe just to ask, Verna uh, May, you've written how many books now? Six. Six. <laughs> Six. And, your, and your first book was My Villages, right? Yeah. And your latest is just the, what, the one we just have mm -hmm. out there now. Okay. Uh, are you still planning on continuing to write after this? Oh, well, as long as I can. I have drawerfuls of things at home all set to take out and see what I can do with. And Roy's all set to get back to work and go to the library and Brent and archives and everywhere, you know. And, uh, there, you know, he, he went to Brampton. So many times they're going to buy a new uh, one of those machine microfilm things, you know, all these machines, and uh, you know it's all worn out. So they're going to buy a new one, and they told Roy they used to let him in to the archives an hour early in the morning so that he could stay longer. And you know, they told them that when we get the new one in, we're going to put a plaque on it with your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a lot of fun with this book. We meet, we meet a, if you ever want to meet a lot of nice people and enjoy yourself, well, write a book. I mean, you do. You meet some wonderful people that way. And uh, you get into some wonderful places too. My goodness, I've, I've gone down to Toronto to these huge skyscraper buildings, you know, so many floors up where I'm terrified to go, but I go and I meet all these people that, good gracious me, I'd never meet them in my whole life. But here I go in there and they're just like everybody else and I have a wonderful time. <laughs> and you know, it's it's nice. You meet, you meet people and see them just as they really are. They're not you know, maybe what you expect to talk. You see their names in the paper and this and that. And you think, oh, well, that's a big shot, you know, or <laughs> high up, you know. <laughs> but you go in and they're just so nice and uh, and and uh, it makes you happy to, to, to do that. And, you know, I used to be terrified of school teachers, terrified of high school teachers, but all my kids be, and my grandchildren became school high school teacher, so now I'm not scared of them at all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to be scared of professors until I went to a dinner at the Heritage and met some of them from Airdale, and, and you know, they, they talked to me so nicely, and I thought, oh, they're nice. <laughs> so you get a lot of ideas that changes all your feelings about things, you know? So I, I hardly endorse writing books, and if anybody wants that, enjoy themselves. They say it keeps you young, and, and I think it does. I tell you what I like to do, if I'm not taking too much of your time. I like to go, but what I really do is, I don't often go out and speak to people like you, I'm scared of people anyway, but <laughs> I go into the schools and talk to the kids. You know, in the library, they all sit on the floor and they all talk to me like I'm um, Grandmother Moses or somebody. I sit, they give me a rocking chair and I say, I don't want a rocking chair. What do you give me a rocking chair for? But I go in and I talk and I, I try to tell them about the old days. Like they say, what was here before my school was here? And, you know, things like that. And then they want to know, how much did your father pay for his house when he bought it? And I said, well, the first house my father bought. Cost it was new house, cost twenty eight hundred dollars, and I said he put down four hundred or eight hundred dollars on it. And he had a mortgage for two hundred dollars or two thousand dollars, and you know this German kid stands up. And he says, "What do you mean?" He says, twenty eight hundred dollars." He says, "That can't be." He says, "A house costs over a hundred thousand dollars." Oh, you know, 
it's, it's so, you know, and then I said to him, oh, well, yes, but I'll write now. Wait a minute here. Let's see. It's all relative. You know, you've got to figure out what were times like then. I said, I told him my father earned $33 every two weeks. And I said, what about all the groceries he had to buy? And, you know, pay for this and pay for that. How long do you think it'll take you to figure to, to save up eight hundred dollars? You know, so all the kids got out their pens and papers and they started figuring out how much everything cost. And oh, we had a great time, you know. So you can enjoy yourself with the children. They're pretty smart. They really can give you what for when you go in there because you have to, you know, you have to <coughs> figure out things with them. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you something now. Um, the heritage people know about it. But my first book about my villages, you know, I told about when I was growing up in Port Fed, about my grandfather and my grandmother and all that, you know. Well, they made the kids of grade five and six at Sawmill Valley School, they made a play out of my book. And it was a trip. They went up to Credit River in this boat with Grand, Grandpa. And they, they went up, and everything was old. They saw all the old things. And then they came back down, and everything was as it is today. And they made up the most interesting uh, little play with all this, all this uh, vocabulary, you know, and all the air, all the, you know, uh, the way they spoke. And then I, I took them over some of my music, you know. And they played and they sang and they did all those old, old music pieces. And it turned out to be a very nice play. I liked it a lot. And so I was happy that they did that. And uh, so I thought, well, they enjoy it. And if you can make kids enjoy anything with anything you write today, well, I think you've really, <laughs> I think you've really done something. But they made me happy. And that's what I did out of writing books, actually, when I go to see the kids. They do things. 